You know, the reality is the second that you say yes to Jesus and you accept Christ into your life is the very moment the enemy steps in and he begins to attack your life and your purpose and everything that God has in store for you. Uh, He attacks the person that God has intended for you to be. And so as a believer, you're going to spend your entire life as a Christian fighting, defending your faith. And that's what we want to talk to you about today. And as a matter of fact, that's what we've titled this series. But we're not talking about defending your faith from a doctrinal debate standpoint with human beings, but about spiritual warfare with demons. Now, if you're new to the faith or maybe you're just checking things out, you're thinking about you know, this whole thing called the Christian walk, just trying to figure out if, if, if it's for real or not. I know that when we begin to talk about things like demons, it can sound so, you know, mystical and so fairy taleish, and like, you know, that's really just only in the movies. That's not really a real thing. But I can assure you, if you've been living for God more than a minute, you know that Satan is real. And in fact, scripture says in Ephesians 6 and 12, it says, for we wrestle not against flesh and blood enemies, but against evil rulers and authorities of this unseen world, against mighty powers in this dark world and against evil spirits in the heavenly places. I'm going to throw a a phrase on the screen and I want you to take a picture of it because I think this really captures just in a nutshell what the enemy is trying to do and why. It says this, when you step out in faith, the enemy will attack you in an effort to get you to give up prematurely to prevent you from acquiring the promises God has for you and before you can accomplish the good things He planned for you years ago before you were ever born. And I'll just say this early on in the message. I hope you wore your steel toe boots because we are going to step on your toes this morning. And someone said, oh, shoot. (laughs) Yeah, it's going to happen. Because we're good pastors and because we love you and we want you to grow in your faith and we don't want you to you know, get your tail handed to you each and every day. You know, as pastors, for many years that we've been serving the local church, we've seen so many believers really not experience much attack to the level of what we're going to talk to you about today. Because for whatever reason, some Christians choose to really just not get in the fight. And they've made the decision that they will not really pursue their purpose. And so they never really become this intimidation factor for the enemy. They don't take church seriously. They don't take their calling seriously. They don't take the kingdom seriously. But I want to tell you, it's very, very real, more real than we are looking at each other in the flesh right now. The kingdom of God and the kingdom of darkness is very, very real. Just because you can't see it doesn't mean that it's not there. Just because it's not in front of you doesn't mean that it doesn't exist. It does, and it is so very real. And and the reality is, is you're going to have to decide for yourself whether or not you are going to get in the game. And getting in the game is stepping out in faith. We talk about faith a lot in church, but you know, this is really what our walk, our kingdom walk is all about. It's stepping out in obedience, stepping out in the things that are hard for us to do in our flesh, but so please God. And we'll give you a list of examples here. And I just want you to think of some of the different ways that maybe you have stepped out in faith, but maybe some of the other things are foreign to you. These are ways that you could possibly step out in faith. And it could be just the first step of coming to to Jesus and just accepting him as Lord and Savior of of your life. That is a huge step of faith. And guess what? You're going to have to defend that faith. As I said a moment ago, the second you say yes to Jesus, the enemy is going to come against you. He is going to attack your faith, and you're going to have to learn how to defend it. And today's message is called, you know, get your guard up. You got to get your guard up. How many of you guys know if you're in a fight, you're trying to defend yourself, you got to get your guard up. Do you guys know that? If you don't, you're going to get punched in the face. Do you know that? You got to get your guard up. You got to protect your jaw and your teeth. You're going to get this left hook and you're going to get knocked out. You got to get your guard up. You know, another way you might be stepping out of your faith is, is maybe through water baptism last week. Oh my word, so many courageous people in their faith stepped out and went public with their faith. Yeah, we had 48 people last Sunday morning who stepped out and went public with their faith. Between all three, how incredible. And you gotta know that as soon as you step out and you step out of that seat and you take that step to go public with your faith, the enemy is gonna take that step closer to you because she puts a hit on your head. That's right. 
So you look at these different ways. Maybe it's stepping out in the tithe. Maybe you've not trusted God in the tithe yet, but I want to tell you right now, it is the most elementary thing you can do because it is, it is all about trust which is the key ingredient for any relationship. If you don't trust somebody, you don't have a relationship and God established the tithe primarily to know whether or not he could trust you and we could trust him. That's what it is. God says, do you trust me or not to be your provision, to be your protection, to be your blessings, to take care of you? I wanna take care of you. I want to be your God. I want you to be my people, but you gotta trust me. See, it's not about the church wanting your money, guys. This is about relationship with God. This is about relationship with the one who made us. And yes, it's a faith test. But God, God, it's the only, it's the only scripture in the word of God where he says, guess what? You can test me in this one thing. Test me and see if I won't prove how faithful I am. Yeah, it's a faith test. But guess what? When you do that and you step out and you try it, you better get ready because the enemy's going to come after you. He doesn't want you trusting God. He doesn't want you having a relationship with God. He doesn't want to see your obedience and your sacrifice make a difference in the kingdom of God. He didn't want to see you guys make those first time faith commitments with your biggest and best offering and commit some of you over a period of three years to be able to build God's house and make his, his, these buildings bigger so we can make more room for people to make heaven their home and then receive Jesus as Lord and savior. He doesn't want to see you do that. But when you do, guess what? You better get ready because the enemy is going to fight you. You're going to have to defend your faith. You're going to have to get your guard up. It can be in many different ways. Serving, it can be through fasting and prayer, sharing your faith at work, whatever it is. Whatever God calls you to do, he calls all of us to do so many things. But when you step out in faith, just know you're going to have to defend it. And when you defend your faith, you're going to have to get your guard up. Why? Because the enemy wants to take you out prematurely before you ever reach that place of purpose. Believe it or not, you really are a threat to the kingdom of darkness when you step into the person that God has called you to be, but it's a, it's a maturing process. You don't just start out that way. You're not just born a brand new baby believer. You don't just come to Christ and you step out and you're like, here I am, like I'm a fully developed follower of God and I'm ready to take on the world and all the kingdom of darkness with one arm behind my back. That's not how it works. You gotta grow. You gotta grow into it. And as you're growing, he wants to take you out as quick as he possibly can so that you don't mature into that fully devoted follower that God has called you to be. Because inside of you, inside of me, are gifts and abilities and callings, and they're all unique and different. You, don't, you have different abilities than I have. You have different resources than I have. We're all different, but together, we can make this incredible difference where we just make demons scatter. And it's so beautiful, such a beautiful picture how God has just gifted each and every one of us in this room that when we come together in unity, what we can do for God and for his kingdom and how we can come against the kingdom of darkness. The best way I like to illustrate it, and I I truly, this is very, very theological. Sometimes I just, I want to go really deep with you because I believe you can handle it. I believe that a lot of life's answers can be found in the movie, The Lion King. And it's so true. It is so deep. Amen? Looks like we got a Lion King fan over here. But think about it, really. You know, Simba's dad is taken out. He's king. And then who steps into the scene immediately? Uncle Scar. Uncle Scar steps into the scene, and his main objective now for the rest of the movie is to take out who? Come on, preach it with me, people. Come on. Simba. Right? Right? Why does he want to take Simba out while Simba is a cub? Right? He's not fully developed. But what does, what does Scar see in Simba that Simba doesn't even see yet in himself? That one day Simba is going to grow stronger and stronger and stronger until one day Simba will be the Lion King. He'll be big and strong and capable of leading that entire kingdom. And Scar wants the kingdom for himself. Satan wants the kingdom for himself. Satan sees things inside of you that you don't even see in yourself yet. And he's trying to take you out because he doesn't want you to step into the person that God has called you to be. He doesn't want you to possess the calling and the promises of God and all the good things that God planned for you so many years ago. But we have so many weak Christians 
that are so consumed by the things of this life, so distracted by the pleasures of this world and pursuing our own happiness, that there's this fatality that happens in the human life. We live our life just only to barely make it into the kingdom. Just barely squeeze through the door at the end of this life for God to say, well, I would have said, well done, but you really didn't try very hard, but I'm glad you made it. I don't want that to be my story. You shouldn't want that to be your story. We should want with all of our heart to be everything that God intended for us to be, but it's going to take stepping out in faith. It's going to take defending that faith. It's going to take getting your guard up. So today we want to teach you from a passage of scripture where the Lord himself, Jesus, shows us how to get our guard up when we're defending our faith. So as we said last week, we baptized 48 people. They went public with their faith. Well, when you go to the book of Luke and you look in Luke chapter three, verse 21, we see that Jesus set that example. He himself was baptized. Today, we're gonna go into Luke chapter four. It's right after Jesus is baptized. And I want you to notice what happens. The very thing we're talking about, about having to defend your faith, even Jesus went through. But what I love about Jesus is that there's nothing that you and I will go through that he didn't already go through and show you how to handle it. He literally walked before us in every way, shape, and form, and he gives us the example. So go with us to Luke chapter four. I'm gonna start reading in verse one, and it says this. Then being filled with the Holy Spirit, returned from the Jordan... And Jordan is where he had been baptized, all right? So Jesus is full of the Spirit. He's returned from the Jordan, and he was led by the Spirit into the wilderness. I'm going to pause for just a moment. We don't have time to teach all these points today, but you need to notice, and if you have your Bible, I would be circling or highlighting, filled with the Spirit. Jesus was full of the presence of God. When he went into the wilderness, he was going into the wilderness already filled. He was so proud of what he had done, okay? He had gone public with his faith. He had gone out in front of everybody else. He's about to step into his public ministry. He has gone public with his faith. Now the Holy Spirit literally, it says that he's led into the wilderness. Now you may think to yourself, wait a second, I've never really noticed that. It says the Spirit led him into the wilderness. Well, if you know what's about to happen, Jesus is going to fast for 40 days and pray. 40 days. We just came through a fast. We do it every month. We fast two meals. We encourage you, we challenge you to fast two meals for Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday at the beginning of every month. And I cannot tell you how many times when people take that step of faith, that while they're fasting, the enemy comes so hard against them because he knows that when you take that step of faith, you're growing stronger. When you do the hard things, you're getting stronger. So Jesus goes into the wilderness. It says, go pick it up in verse two. It says being tempted for 40 days by the devil. And in those days he ate nothing. And afterward, when they had ended, he was hungry. Now I want to just pause for just a second. A lot of times I grew up reading this passage of scripture. I heard it taught. I always thought that Jesus fasted for 40 days Then the enemy came and he tempted him. And that's not what the word of God says. The moment he took that step and he goes into the wilderness and you say, why did he do that? He wanted to spend that time with his father. He wanted to be empowered even more as he knew he was about to launch into public ministry. So at this point, nobody knew he was the Messiah, okay? He hasn't stepped fully into his calling yet. He goes into the wilderness to spend quiet time with his father, And as soon as he does, bam, the attack comes. And you may ask yourself, well, why does God allow things like that to happen? I mean, why is it that the attack comes right after we take a step of faith? You know, I'll tell you last week, you know, we made commitments to help expand the buildings. And if you look around, you know why we're doing this, okay? To make more room for more families to experience life change. One of our daughters, Blake, had made a commitment on Sunday Monday morning rolls around. They are going back to college. Brad and I get a phone call from the girls and they said, we got a flat tire right before we hit I-44. So we're at the gym. We left, we got in the car, we head over there. Brad starts changing it. And we realized that the inside of their tires were complete wire 
showing on the inside, not the outside. We had no idea. One, God just protected them in that moment. But here's what I want you to understand, okay? Blake's 18 years old. She made a commitment to expand this building so the more people could come in here and hear the message of hope about Jesus. Monday morning, we realized that she blows a tire. Brad looks across at the other tire. He checks it and he says, babe, two new tires. You have to have two new tires. We're gonna put one on. We're gonna get you guys to Tulsa. Today, we have to get these things changed. And you know, because they're adults, we don't come to the rescue. Blake had to buy two new tires that day. But guess what? God provided. God provided. But here's what the enemy wanted her to think. That was a dumb thing you did yesterday. You just made that commitment for the next three years. That was stupid. You see, you got a car and cars break down and things go wrong and you should have held on to that money for yourself. You know what? Just don't, just don't do it. Don't follow through. That's how the enemy works. But here's what happens. When you stay the course, you get stronger. Notice what happens with Jesus. So he goes into the wilderness and the Bible says in verse three, it says, and the devil came to him and said, if you are the son of God, command these stones to become bread. Now, what was he doing in the wilderness? What did I say he was doing? He's fasting. So he's hungry. So what is the very thing that the enemy does? He comes to you when you are weak and vulnerable and he dangles in front of your face the very thing that is the, the most tempting to you in that moment. Jesus on another day, it would have been like, eh, whatever. He's hungry. He hasn't eaten. So it's the very thing that he's like, come on. Are you really who you say you are? You are really the son of God. Go ahead and do a miracle. Turn those stones in to bread. And I want you to notice what he says following up. He says, it is written. Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. In this moment, Jesus does not engage with the enemy. This is really important, okay? In this moment, he does not have a conversation with the enemy. You know who did have a conversation with the enemy? Eve in the book of Genesis. In the book of Genesis, you see when the... That's so Just bad. throw it down. That is so bad. Do you know how many people that go to take these mics and you I tell them how the expensive floor. they are? <laughs> I don't know what just happened. Okay. I'm going to blame happening. that one on the devil. I am going to blame that on him because here's the thing. He doesn't want you hearing what we're <laughs> preaching today. So he wants to rattle my cage by making me look like a fool, even to the online family. Okay. Well, we're all family. Okay. At least I didn't fall on my can or something. Okay. Here we go. Go back to this. In the garden, when Eve, you can cut that out, by the way, anybody editing for us today, okay? <laughs> go back to Genesis. In the garden, when the serpent came to Eve, she engaged in conversation with the enemy. He came and he said, surely you won't die. And she began to have a conversation with the enemy. Notice that Jesus did not do that. When the enemy came and said, hey, come on, just turn those stones into bread. He did not have any conversation. He did not contemplate in his mind. Well, you know, I could do that. I wonder if God would mind. I mean, come on, is it that big of a deal? Nobody even knows I'm out here fasting. I could totally break this fast and start again in the morning. It wouldn't even be that big of a deal. He had no conversation. He simply quoted the word of God. It is written. Bam. That's what he did. Two more times, the enemy tempts him. You can go ahead. And I'm not going to read this whole passage, but between verses 4 through 12, two more times he comes to him. The next one, he says, hey, look at all the kingdoms of the world. You see, I'm the prince of the air. I can give all of this to you. It's mine to give. If you'll just bow down and worship me. Again, Jesus, no conversation. He says, it is written. Third, he comes to him one more time and he says, you know what? You could just command the angels of heaven to just come. You could dash your foot against a stone. He tempts him one more time. And again, what does he say? It is written. There's no conversation. So today you need to begin to understand three things that if you are going to put your guard up, if you're going to defend your faith, you have to know these three things. Number one is simply this. Satan's attacks are strategic and timely. He did not attack Jesus when he was strong. He didn't attack him when he was with his pack, all right? He waited till he was in isolation. Let me just tell you right now, here's a plug for life groups. You know why we plug life groups so much? Because if you are isolated, you can be annihilated, all right? 
When you are all by yourself, the enemy attacks even harder. Jesus is off by himself. He's vulnerable. He's weak because he's hungry. That is the very time that the enemy will attack you. The very time that he's going to come is when you're weak and vulnerable. He's not waiting till Simba grows up. He's going to pounce while you're still young, while you're still growing. All right, so check this out. Satan attacked him in three different ways, and he's going to do the same thing with you. He's going to hit you from all these different angles because he's testing you for weakness. What he knows is he might attempt to hit you two different ways and it doesn't work, but maybe that third way, if he hits you from a completely different angle, he's going to succeed. Look at the way that he attacked Jesus. The first way is Jesus had made a commitment to fast for 40 days because he was preparing for this big ministry launch. So this was a commit, a personal commitment that Jesus made to his father. Think about personal commitments. So you've stepped down your faith, you've made a commitment and you've just, you, God's laid something on your heart and you've decided, God, I'm going to do this between you and I. This is a commitment. I'm going to do it. The enemy is going to always attack your commitment to God. Right. Satan will attack your commitments, okay? Uh, many of you made uh, promises through and pledges through this uh, Be the Church, Build the Church stewardship campaign. You don't think the enemy is going to attack that commitment? L look what he did with our daughter, Blake. Just the very, very next day, we see him bringing attack on her life because she made a, commi a commitment to God, and he wants us to break covenant, break commitment. He doesn't want to see us follow through with the things that we promised God because he know the, knows the payout on the other side is us stepping into our purpose. The second way that he attacked him is he attacked his contentment. Think about this. He showed Jesus everything that he could give him because, you know, Satan is ruler and the darkness of this earth and of this world. And he offered all these things to Jesus. Think about how oftentimes, you know, the enemy will cause you to think about all the things that God has given you. And he convinces you that it's just not good enough. Think about how oftentimes Satan is so good at getting you to survey what you have but exposing what you don't have. See, scripture says, if you will be faithful in the little things, I will make you ruler over much. The reason so many of you aren't experiencing ruling over much is because you haven't learned to be faithful and thankful in the little things. And it's such an elementary lesson in the faith, but when you can get over it, I'm telling you, when you can get through it and you can learn it, then you can step into those bigger things that God has for you, but it's all a trust factor. I mean, let's, can I just get real? I told you to bring your steel toe shoes. If you can't do something so simple as trusting God in the tithe, this elementary thing. If you can't trust him, how on earth is he going to trust you with all this stuff over here, all these resources, all these things that he wants to use? If you won't trust him, how can he trust you? Do you understand what he's trying to teach us in our walk with him? Do you understand? Satan's constantly trying to get us to test and question our contentment. In everything give thanks for this is the will of God. And the third way that he attacked him as he attacked his calling. He said, come on, you're the son of God. You have access to all these promises and all, all these powers and all these things. You know, you could, you could jump off this temple and won't the angels catch you? If you call on them, won't they, won't they catch you, right? Here he is twisting the truth of God's word, trying to get Jesus to, to identify his calling, but he's causing him to, to use that calling for the wrong purpose. He, Satan will so many times, he will come at you and he'll use something that God has said is true and then he'll twist it and he'll manipulate it to get you to do what he wants you to do. You're going to have to learn how to defend your faith. You're going to have to learn how to get your guard up. If you're going to live for God, you're going to have to learn how to get in the fight. But these are the most common ways that Satan comes against us and attacks us. It's clearly laid out in 1 John 2.16. It says, for all that is in the world, these are the three different ways that Satan commonly attacks people through the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and through the pride of life. Is not of the, these things is not of the Father, but it is of the world. All right, so the first way he comes is he's very strategic and very timely. The second thing that you need to know is literally how to defend, and that is with the word of God. We watch Jesus in each scenario, and he literally quotes the word of God. I want you to understand in the Greek, there's two different words for the word of God in the Greek, and it's really important that you understand this. So the first one is logos. Say logos. 
You just spoke in Greek, okay? The first is the written word. It literally is the word of God. God breathed, written down. You can read it. It's his story. It's history. The second definition in the Greek for the word is rhema. Say rhema. Rhema is a personal word. I want you to understand this, okay? I'm trying to break it down to the easiest, e- easiest way for you to understand it. It's literally God speaking to you personally. Now, how many of you guys have ever, if you've read your word, you're reading along and you just feel like there's something that like jumps off the page at you and you're like, man, I believe that's for me right now. Anybody ever had that happen? Yes, that's a rhema word. Here's the difference. You need the logos. You need the written word because you need to understand his story. So you take that in every day. You take that in. But then there every day, you need God to speak personally to you from his word. That is why oftentimes when you are being attacked, we will say to someone, what's your rhema word? What is your rhema word? What is the personal word God is speaking to you right now in the middle of the battle? And sometimes I don't want to hear it. Like, I'll just be honest. Like, Brad, we've been talking like this way for years and years, as long as we've been married. And if I'm feeling attacked or he's feeling attacked, one of us will say, what's your rhema word? And it's like, go away right now. I'm not giving you my rhema word. You know why? Because in that moment, I'm not feeling it, you know? But that's what you need. That's what you need as an accountability person. You need a friend. You need somebody in your life group. When you're getting your tail handed to you and you feel that attack to ask you, what is God personally speaking to you right now? You don't know? Well, guess what, girlfriend? Go get your Bible and open it up because God is going to speak to you. He's going to give you a download. But guys, listen, do you know the biggest way the enemy attacks you? He tries to keep you out of the word of of God. Oh, you're too busy. I know there's 24 hours in a day. How in the world could we take a few and just read his word? But that's what he does. How many of you guys have ever opened your Bible and you've got that time set aside and you begin to read and all of a sudden your brain starts thinking about something else, or maybe you're on your phone and you're reading on you version, you're reading that plan. And all of a sudden you get a notification from Facebook or from YouTube and you pop over for just a second. You don't want to miss something. And the next thing you know, you've scrolled for 15 or 20 minutes and absolutely it, it, it does nothing. Let's spend another 20 minutes of our life with mindless scrolling <laughs> on social media. Doesn't that sound like fun? But that, listen, you need to understand. I know it's funny, but this is literally the enemy strategy because he knows guys, if there's one thing we could teach you is just get in the word. Cause I know God will speak to you. He will give you a rhema word. If you will just open his word and I challenge you, I challenge you. If you do not read your word every day, I challenge you to begin. Give him five minutes in the word, just five minutes. We talk often about the 15 minute challenge, five minutes of worship, five minutes of prayer, five minutes in the word. Guys, that is not much time, but I'm telling you in five minutes in the word, God can download in you. God can give you a word that you can stand on. And I'm telling you that when you are really attacked, guys, it's the Holy Spirit that begins to bring back to your memory the things that you've hidden in your heart. The psalmist said, I will hide the word in my heart so I won't sin against God. If you haven't hidden it there, when the attack is coming, we don't often have the the time to go find our Bible or to find our phones. But if you've hidden it in your heart, you can say greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. Saying you do not have any call. You don't have any hold upon my life in this moment right now. You know, you begin to quote those scriptures that you've hidden in your heart. The third thing and final thing that you got to know today is Satan will not win. Take heart. Satan will not win. Yeah, you can give God a hand. He's already been defeated. He does not win. Check this out. Verse 13, it says this. Now, when the devil had ended every temptation, he departed from him until an opportune time. Now, that's another message for another day. What that means is he left for a time, but he's coming back. Okay? But in that day, he was defeated. Verse 14, then Jesus returned in the power of the spirit to Galilee and news of him went out all throughout the surrounding regions and he taught in the synagogues being glorified by all. It says he returned in power. Jesus was victorious and you as well will be victorious if you will learn to put your guard up and defend your faith. Amen. Guys, that's all we have to do. As we're concluding this service today, we really hope that when you, when you leave this room, that you recognize that the enemy is after you but he doesn't win. That's right. 
You have to choose to fight. You have to choose to put your guard up. You have to know the word of God. You have to engage the enemy and the fight is fixed. So you're going to be, you know, this, this person that has this mentality of just getting your tail handed to you every day, or you're going to learn how to fight. If somebody attacked you, if you got jumped by a bunch of dudes, what is going to be your natural response? Are you just going to curl up in a ball and just get beat to death? Or are you going to do something, do anything to try to defend yourself? I think any person with any bit of common sense is going to try to do something to try to defend themselves. Here's the beauty of this. We win. Like the fight is fixed. All you have to do is activate and access the word of God. The word wins. So know the word, be strong, be steadfast, be full of the spirit and fight and you'll win each and every day. I want to pray for you right now. Father, I lift up every person in this room. You know them by name. You created them. You breathed life into them. You gave them a purpose while on this planet that you would be glorified through them with their time, talent, and treasure. I pray in Jesus' name that every person in this room, every person watching online would fight. I pray that they would get their guard up I pray, Lord, that they would dig into your word, that they would resist the enemy, and they would win. I pray that you would fill them with your spirit continually, Father God. I pray that you'd give them the victory each and every day of their lives, Father. Let them walk out of this place. Let them jump offline today, Father God, feeling victorious, knowing the truth, God, that they are made more than conquerors in Christ Jesus knowing greater is he who is in me than he that is in the world, knowing that they have overcome by the blood of the lamb and by the word of their testimony. Help us today, God, to be everything you've called us to be as we defend our faith and get our guard up. With heads bowed and eyes closed, you know, the first step of faith that you can take is accepting Jesus to be Lord of your life. That's the first step. And though the enemy is going to attack, it's okay because, man, this is what life is all about. It's living for him and living in eternity with him. So my question for you is, have you made that decision? If you're watching online or if you're in this room, have you made the decision to make Jesus Lord of your life? And if you haven't, what are you waiting for? It's the best decision you'll ever make. And it can happen by simply saying, God, I I, I admit to you today that I'm a sinner And I ask you to forgive me. I believe that Jesus is the son of God and I confess him to be Lord of my life. And I just wanna ask you with heads bowed and eyes closed today, is there anybody in this room that you just say, that's me. I I wanna make Jesus Lord of my life. I wanna make heaven my home. We're gonna pray a prayer together as a church family. But before we do, who am I praying with today? If that's you, would you just lift your hand up nice and high so I can see you? Thank you on my left and in the back. Thank you. Right up the middle, I see your hand. I see those two hands on my right. Thank you. Anybody else today? Thank you on the bleed. I see your hand. Praise God. About six people just gave their lives to Jesus and changed their eternal address. Isn't that awesome? Praise God. Yeah, come on. Give God a hand clap of praise. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. I just, I can't help but to think that when people say yes to Jesus, it's, it's a culmination of so many things. It's because other people stepped out in faith to give financially so that we can have this room, so that we can do this broadcast, so we can have these services. I think about people who stepped out in faith to serve. All all of these things that we talked about today, all of these people defending their faith made it possible for these who just raised their hand to step out in their faith and know Jesus and make heaven their home. God, you're good. And so we're just gonna go before him right now. We're gonna pray this prayer together as a church family in support of those that have made this decision. So let's pray this. Father, Father, forgive me of my sins. Forgive me of my sins. I believe with all my heart. I believe with all my heart. Jesus is the Son of God. Jesus is the Son of I God. I confess Him. I confess to be him Lord of my life. To be the Lord of today. my life today. God help me. God help me to defend my faith. To defend my faith. Help me to keep my guard up. Help me to keep my guard up each and every day. Each and every day. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Amen.